Okay, ready to go. Welcome everyone, dear speakers and audience. Thank you very much for joining us today. We'll be starting shortly. Allow me first to switch into Arabic and address our Arabic audience today. And then I will switch back into English, uh, which will be the official language of this panel discussion. I would like to inform you that this session is recorded and we have um, a language interpretation. Marhaban bikum, l'azizat wal a'izza, al-mutabi'in wal mutabi'at bil lugal arabiya. Hadihi al-nadwa sofa takun bil lugal inglisiya. ولكن الترجمة للغة العربية متوفرة ويمكنكم الاستماع للترجمة من خلال النقر على أيقونة الكرة الأرضية في أسفل الشاشة واختيار اللغة العربية خلال فقرة الأسئلة والتعليقات يمكنكم طرح الأسئلة والتعليقات باللغة العربية وسوف يتم ترجمتها من قبل المترجمين والمترجمات المشاركين معنا في الجلسة للمتابعين والمتابعات للبث المباشر على قناة يوتيوب يمكنكم سماع هذه الجلسة باللغة العرب الإنجليزية فقط ولكن سيتم توفير اللغة العربية خلال اليومين القادمين على موقع Law for Palestine ومجددا نشكر حضوركم وأهلا وسهلا We are now switching back to English uh, My name is Diana Alzir from Al-Haq Palestine and I will be moderating this session today with you I would like to welcome all the distinguished speakers and audience who are present with us today, including those who are watching us through the live stream on YouTube. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this very important discussion, um, which will discuss specifically the UN Special Rapporteur Milestone, Milestone Report on Palestine, resuming rights-based discourse. This event is organized by Law for Palestine, and in partnership with ARDD. This report particularly discussed the details of the Israeli occupation in the Palestinian occupied territory, explaining why the international dominant approaches to deal with the situation are ineffective and why the newly advanced apartheid discourse is also insufficient. It is very important in this context to look at the paradigm shift that this report is particularly trying to do in the context of Palestine and in the occupied Palestinian territory in particular, with the shedding light particularly also on the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. In this report, the UN Special Rapporteur Fran Francesca Albanese provides a comprehensive analysis exploring and raising awareness on Israel's settler colonial practices in the OPT and offers the international community with recommendations to how to end the Israel's illegal occupation. Without further ado, and without me elaborating further on this, I would like to give the floor to our UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the occupied Palestinian territory or Palestinian territory occupied since 1967. Francesca is also a senior advisor at ARDD and is a research affiliate at the Institute for Study of International Migration at Georgetown University. Francesca, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, good evening or good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for organizing this event and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the report I just presented to the General Assembly. Um, I, I do like the fact that you called it a milestone report, but it's not because I wrote it, it's because it's about a milestone right, which is the right of self-determination. Uh, the reason why I decided to focus on this right and to do that at the very beginning of my mandate was because this right not only is foundational, it's the right of all rights, it's the right um, that belongs to the people as a people uh, par excellence, but also it's foundational to the UN system, to the UN system and international law-based order that emerged after the Second World War. 
and uh, and it's also uh, recognized as an inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. And despite all this, it rem remains unfulfilled. Um, so I wanted to to investigate its meaning and implication. Also, because I realized that not only it's unrealized, it's also strongly misunderstood. Uh, and I'll uh, comment on, on it in a few minutes. But so in a, in a nutshell, the right of self-determination is the, the right of all people to determine their political will and pursue their economic and social development. It's first and foremost the right to be independent, to exist as a people and be protected as a people. Because having external protection means then the ability to organize themselves internally. A state that has the paraphernalia of a state that runs schools and ministry, but is not free to protect its own citizens and to determine in the entry and access and exit uh, from an um, uh, in and, and from its own territory is not an independent state, and therefore it's subjugated. This is the case of the of the state of Palestine that exists, but it's engaged by an occupation that has been ongoing since 1970. Uh, sorry, 1967. Um, so I I do argue that the Israeli occupation in, in the Palestinian territory that remains of what was the ancestral territory of, um, of Palestine um, is, is not only illegal because it's not temporary, it's not carried out, uh, taking into account the best interest of the occupied population, it has translated into annexation, which is illegal in and of itself. But it but it's also illegal because, as uh, uh, Professor Ardim says, argues, it has translated, it has, been, it has been the vehicle to implement a racialized apartheid regime. And it's also, um, it also violates a fundamental right, which is the right of self-determination. The right of self-determination has been violated by the very existence of the occupation since 1967, because as it started, the occupation has been a vehicle for annexing and fragmenting, actually fragmenting and annexing part of the territory under occupation, so breaching the first element of self-determination, which is territorial sovereignty, which is not only recognized by international law, but international consensus, because there is an international consensus within the manifested by the General Assembly and by the Security Council's resolutions as well, which stipulates that the occupied Palestinian territory is the territorial unity for uh, the exercise of the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people in the form of statehood. So without prejudice to the right of self-determination of Palestinian citizens of Israel or Palestinian refugees. The, the, the other element that the um, Israeli occupation is in breach of is the there's the sovereignty over natural resources. Because as I said in the very beginning, um, right of self-determination means the possibility of a people to use its own resources to develop, to pursue its own um, economic and then social development. But when there is an occupying power which seizes land, grazing and, and farming land, quarries, water, and even oil for its own uh, interest and purposes, or for the purpose, or, or for the benefits of colonists and third parties and other businesses. This is, of course, a clear breach of the right of self determination. And so is also a breach of self determination, the continuous um, prohibition, the continuous impediment of the formation and expression of Palestinian polity and political will. I argue in the report, I document how Israel has been after Pal the Palestinian leadership, even the intellectuals, the writers, not just the, 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 the military ranks, uh, through targeted killings and, and mass imprisonment from the very early days of the, of the occupation in the occupied Palestinian territory. And, um, and uh, of course, this has evolved, the mass arrest and massive arrest and detention um, have been a practice of the occupying, uh, occupying power. And now the aberration of this is evident in the draconian measures that are taken even against human rights organizations, 
<laughs> among others, al-Haq. So even this expression of activity or political activity and resistance is persecuted under occupation. And last but not least, I, identif I identified a breach of the cultural a violation of the cultural existence of and as a people under occupation. In fact, the erasure, suppression of symbol of Palestinian identity, being them a church, a museum, um, a political institution, or uh, or the thorn, the 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 uh, the, um, the seizure of of these places, the uh, the turning them into something else, but even being after political symbols of or symbols of identity like a flag represent the dimension, give a sense of the dimension of the suppression of the, 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 the cultural space of the Palestinian people. Because of all these reasons, I argue that the violation of the right of self-determination is inherent to Israel's occupation and gives, uh, gives the occupation the hallmark of settler colonialism. Because settler colonialism is about uh, displacing the native population and replacing with an indigenous, uh, so with um, with the other nationals, with foreign nationals, so with the nationals of the occupying power in this case. And this is again nothing else than settler colonialism. I also criticize the way the international community approaches this question instead of. Um, addressing the, the, the illegality of, uh, of the Israeli occupation has resulted into um, focusing on manifestations of this illegality, violations of economic, social and cultural rights or violations of gender rights or children rights. Not that these rights are not important, of course they are. But again, I have the, the sense that the bigger picture gets missed. And so as I often say, we miss the forest for the trees. Even the, the economic approach, expecting that the, Palestinian under, the Palestinians under occupation can survive without freedoms and just through boosting the economy, this is a fallacy. And so it's a fallacy expecting that the Palestinians should be able to negotiate the condition of their um, subjugation. It doesn't make sense to ask for the Palestinians to wait um, until the negotiation uh, process in order to enjoy their right of self-determination. This is why in the beginning I was saying this is also the most misunderstood right. And with this, I conclude. I think that the right of self-determination should be the precondition to negotiate anything else between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Freedom will bring peace, but first and foremost, the occupation must be uh, dismantled and all rights of the Palestinians, starting with the rights of self-determination should be, should be respected. Thank you, Special Rapporteur. Uh, very much appreciated indeed uh, this uh, approach um, by looking at the Palestinian people with a holistic lens is a very important approach. And um, also, as you stated at the start or the first page of your report, the analysis due to your uh, limited also mandate um, does tend to exclude large parts of the Palestinian people as a whole including Palestinians living inside Israel, refugees and diaspora Palestinians. Um, I will turn now to my colleague, uh, Wissam Al-Ahmad. Uh, Wissam is a Palestinian American human rights activist. He's head of the Al-Haq Center for Applied International Law in Ramallah. Wissam's area of research focuses on economic incentive structures, entrenching um, the colonization of Palestine through business practices. Wissam, please do let us know, um, how do you think the Palestinian civil society in general uh, views this report? And uh, what has been the critique also, if there, was, if there was any critique on the report? Thank you, Deanna. Um, thank you very much uh, for Law for Palestine uh, for organizing uh, this event. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Special Rapporteur Francesca Albanes, uh, for producing uh, this report. Uh, um, I'm 
trying to speak on behalf of uh, Palestinian civil society as a whole is a, is a challenge for sure. But I can tell you uh, from uh, the, the experience uh, of uh, um, working in the human rights field all these years, um, the report has been very uh, well received. It's a very strong and refreshing report. And I think the strength of the report is uh, really in, uh, in the simplicity of the framing of the problem. Uh, this is this uh, uh, the settler colonial uh, paradigm, and the the issue of colonialism as a whole. I think uh, for many Palestinians is is not something that is surprising to them. Um, uh, it, it reaffirms what they've been saying for decades, and that's what uh, makes it uh, really uh, a refreshing read. Um, and I think. Uh, we need to ask why did it take so long to to get to this point? Uh, there's a, a common saying in in Arabic, uh, and in the general uh, meaning of this is those that are directly enduring the pain will perceive the problems um, and solutions differently from those that are trying to objectively describe and analyze them. And so, if you imagine the Palestinians have been living under the suppression for decades and have been seeing this colonialism uh, um, imposed upon them firsthand, while much of the international community looking from afar, uh, trying uh, to describe and analyze and piece away uh, the different elements of uh, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, uh, getting to the point of uh, uh, recognizing the, the practice uh, of apartheid, uh, well, all of these are uh, part of, as uh, uh, Francesca noted, the, the pursuit of the right to self-determination and the inherent uh, denial of the right to self-determination through any colonial process. And it is this uh, realization, I think, uh, from, from our standpoint, that at least we see uh, it taking um, a more formal form getting to the UN level and opening up uh, this discourse. And I think it's, it's also a natural development uh, at, in a broader sense from uh, the, the global community of seeing the challenges uh, in terms of the realization of the right self-determination in different contexts as well. The idea that colonialism has come to an end is something uh, that, uh, that we need to uh, uh, to uh, overcome and address this reality that actually colonial practices continue in different manifestations. And we see this happening within the Palestinian context in a very sort of uh, classical colonial sense of settler colonialism, but also taking uh, the dimensions of economic colonialism and the exploitation of natural resources and even evolving uh, to, uh, to not only pursue the, the erasure of the native population or replace uh, with, uh, with a settler population, but also uh, the, the exploitation of this captive population in a way that uh, enhances the, the economic value of continuing this colonial endeavor, where the, the people themselves have become subjects uh, of research and, and development uh, that has led to uh, uh, development in, in weapons and technology and, uh, and surveillance uh, technology that is also exported abroad. And so I think this recognition that apartheid is a means to an end and the, the appreciation of a need to step back and see the problem in a more holistic fashion uh, is, is a step in the right direction of addressing the problem in its totality. And, and the issue of requiring a shifting of, uh, of the mind in this uh, paradigm shift, I think uh, also it's, uh, it's something that is required of those that are still trying to understand from afar what is happening. The, the shifting of the mind isn't something that Palestinians need to do. Uh, we have uh, been seeing it uh, firsthand, but it is the, um, the need for those that are trying to address the, the Palestinian question to appreciate that 
that question is one that is rooted in colonialism. <clears throat> and all it requires is a step back in history. Um, and uh, and uh, Francesca does a great job in, in putting this uh, historical dimension, uh, but I think uh, even uh, uh, further back to appreciate uh, the, the mindset and the thinking uh, uh, around the Zionist project and its connection to broader imperial interests uh, help to shed light on the, the, the connection between imperialism, colonialism, and the, the colonization of Palestine. And this uh, issue of the, the colonization of Palestine also requires a constant uh, reassessment because this process is constantly uh, evolving. And it's important to appreciate not only the, the settler uh, dimension of it, but that broader uh, economic dimension uh, that, uh, that continues to evolve and, and turn this into a, a profitable business venture uh, which I call the, the best business practice of colonialism, where Israel has taken the lessons of the Dutch East India Company and the British South Africa Company and continued to refine this uh, art of colonization uh, within the Palestinian context. And there's a lot of uh, uh, reference material uh, in archives that uh, clearly state uh, uh, the, the colonial intentions uh, behind the, the Zionist project and uh, there's one uh, specifically that's titled The Colonization of Palestine, Means and Methods. And I'll put some of these uh, in the chat uh, after I finish uh, my, uh, my intervention. Um, but even if we want to take the, the British uh, approach that, uh, yes, colonialism was bad, but uh, when we did it, the international law did not prohibit it. Well, uh, yes, there's a difference sometimes between what's wrong and what's illegal under international law. And we recognize that international law is also a construct of the international community and the power balance that exists therein. But if we look only at the occupied Palestinian territory post 1967, uh, you see that intention to continue the colonization of Palestine uh, and the role of businesses uh, and their involvement very early on. Uh, many of us are familiar with the, advice, uh, the legal advice uh, that was provided by Theodore Marn um, in uh, 1967, uh, which, uh, which basically questioned uh, the legality under the existing international legal framework of settling in occupied territory. This was his uh, famous uh, legal advice provided in 1967. But in, in 1968, Israel... Uh, took the step to create a modern day crown charter company. This is Israel Corporation. It was a holding company that was intended to attract foreign direct investment in subsidizing the Israeli economy and contributing to the continued colonization of Palestine in the territories that it had newly acquired in 1967. And so those changes early on reflect an intention to continue this colonial project, but doing so uh, through the contemporary means and methods uh, that, uh, that have evolved uh, over time uh, and exploiting these gaps that exist within international law because the, the issue of colonialism uh, being addressed by international law uh, leaves a lot uh, to, uh, uh, um, to be done. The issue of colonial, colonialism requires further work at the international level. And we, we've seen uh, the first discussion uh, around the uh, negative impacts of the legacies of colonialism uh, this past uh, this year uh, during the Human Rights Council. Uh, but these issues addressing the more holistic uh, challenges that we face that also show how Palestine is a microcosm of global injustice um, uh, is, is part of what is, uh, needs to be done on our part as Palestinians, um, but human rights activists as a whole, making the connection between the challenges that we face together and addressing this issue of colonialism in its contemporary manifestation in different forms. And I'll close by just a, a final point uh, to remind everyone that this issue of the elephant in the room of imperialism 
uh, needs to uh, uh, be in our mind when we uh, take uh, uh, this issue of uh, addressing the challenges uh, with regard to colonialism within the Palestinian context. Right now, we're in the fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism, and only three states formally voted no against this initiative in the General Assembly. And those three states were the US, the UK, and Israel. And so if you take anything away from this, it's a question that should be raised in your mind about what is the objection to the eradication of colonialism that continues to exist within the mindset of these three particular states, especially when you take it into a broader historical context and see the relationship that has evolved over time between these, uh, what I refer to as the, the axis of empire. And in order to challenge these, uh, I think uh, it's important to broaden our uh, base of uh, cooperation and collaboration and allies uh, to put forward and challenge some of the main obstacles that uh, come before us. Designation is only one of them. The claims of anti-Semitism are another. Uh, but uh, the issue of the imperial exploitation of the Jewish faith is nothing new. Uh, from Cromwell to Napoleon to Disraeli to Wilson, uh, Truman and Trump, uh, the, the exploitation of the Jewish faith is part and parcel of the colonization of Palestine. And we have allies also within those of the Jewish faith who recognize this uh, uh, exploitation through the Zionist ideology. And so that's why it's great for me to uh, announce that we've only recently uh, published a new visual with Visualizing Palestine in cooperation with Jewish Voices for Peace that address one dimension of this economic incentive structure. And so hopefully by tearing down this facade of uh, a democratic state and exposing the colonial nature therein, uh, we'll be able to overcome these challenges together and move forward and build on uh, the important work uh, that Francesca has done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wissam, for also expanding the horizon of this conversation today and, and scratching also our brains um, on some of the limitations. Um, I would like to remind speakers to please stick to the time. Um, I forgot to uh, thank Francesca for actually sticking to the 10 minutes time earlier. Um, I will turn now to uh, Hadil Abu Hussein. Hadil uh, is a human rights defender and a lawyer from Palestine inside the Green Line. Hadil holds, holds a PhD in international law and is a research fellow at Erasmus University. Hadil, I would like to know your views on this report in the context of Palestinians living inside the Green Line or Palestinians who are holders of the Israeli citizenship. Also, as an international scholar, do you see um, that this report proposes or impacts the academic work, especially academic work that focuses on colonialism and post-colonialism? Hi, thanks, Diana. Sorry for my voice, I'm a little bit sick, but I'm trying my best to speak louder. So apology for that. Um, I'm really, good evening everyone, uh, I'm really delighted to uh, to be with you today, thanks for Legal for Palestine and ARD for organizing this event. Um, the, um, let me first begin with thanking uh, Madame Francesca Labensi for this very impressive report that it draws uh, and offers a comprehensive um, evidence relating to the most fundamental violation of the basic rights of Palestinian people and their continuous struggle. The report explains how the world have failed to hold Israeli account Israel accountable for its continued violation of international human rights law and its apartheid policies in the occupation Palestine territory, including powerful call of decolonization, Palestinian through dismantle once for all Israeli settler colonial occupant and its apartheid regime, in her words, to realize the Palestinian people rights to self-determination. First of all, it's important to recognize that such report for a global campaigning and, and it's followed by great uh, advocacy efforts. This important is considered as apartheid tool um, of its Zionism, settler colonialism and shed the light over the role of its Zionism ideology and institutions in establishing and maintaining these systems. The report confronts the nature of its Zionism project and both racist and settler colonial. 
Therefore, it's unapologetically stand against Israel prolonged occupation request, the recognition of the Israeli, the Palestinian people's self-determination. The fact that Israel defined, it, defining itself as a state, Jewish state, is not merely a symbolic gesture, but rather than the very manifestation of Zionism, settler colonial domination over the Palestinian people. This is the foundation of Israel apartheid regime, as Palestinian scholar Fayez Sayer in 1967 said, Zionism demands racial exclusiveness. And this is Yes. Can. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Diana, I can hear yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, the translator wants you to speak slower. Okay, yeah, sorry. I have the Thank tendency you. to speak faster. Uh, sorry. So I try to speak slower. As Palestinian scholar Faiz Sayer in 1967 said that Zionism, I'm quoting, racial exclusiveness and necessarily reject the coexistence of Jewish and non-Jewish in the land of Jewish regrouping. This is what Zionism demands in his words. One important fact, as Diana already mentioned, that we need to keep in mind while reading this um, while leading this discussion, taking it forward, that there were limitation, geographic limitation uh, of this report by not including Palestinian living in Israel, nor refugees or Palestinian living in diaspora. As explained in the report, yet uh, in her words, in the, in the introduction, the report intentionally exclude those and uh, explained that it was only due to the procedure constraint of her mandate being limited to occupation territory since 67. The premise of the report, in according to what I see, which is right to self-determination, is related to all Palestinian pe as people, not only the geographical, not related to geographical location, nor to legal status. This is why it has kind of the impact also in all Palestinian people under the settler colonial regime. The report also underpins here in, in and emphasize the validity of necessity of using apartheid framework alongside with illegality of occupation as it's crucial to understand and ending Israel domination of Palestine. A milestone of this in new ground that this report dives deep into the root of the problem as we Sam already uh, explained, confronting Palestine unlike previous UN attempts to merely document Israel violation Francesca um, dig deep as attempt to navigate the understanding of the root of the question and emphasize the uh, drastically alerting international approach towards reaching a solution uh, that terminates the occupation and the settler colonialism. This is why um, Special Rapporteur argues that the international community to formally acknowledge and condemn the settler, settler colonial nature of the Israeli occupation demand an immediate and illegal stop and determination of illegal occupation and calling Israel to withdraw the military presence and support the Palestinian civilians in the colonies. They caution all stages against making withdrawal subject of negotiation between Israel and Palestine. The shift of the paradigm that requires is Israel-Palestinian conflict narrative and recognize Israel as intentionally acquisition, segregation, and repressive settler colonial occupant. This can support the scholar dealing with Palestinian issue from my other hat as scholar. They can use this report as a broader integrated framework to understand the issue. As the report highlights significance of the right of self-determination vis-a-vis colonization. The report finds um, occupation as a settler colonial one since the inception. The report doing this by framing the occupation within wider context back to the roots of Zionism and the view of Israeli founders and leaders who have it, uh, no trust evidentially in the failure of the ineffectively of needing of the occupation through negotiation. Special Rapporteur attempts to legally characterize the situation moving beyond repeating the same ineffective solution over and over, such as enduring the occupation, ending the occupation through negotiation and uh, more forward. The evidence provided that the report includes fragmentation policies of the Palestinian people of preventing economic prosperity and exploitation of natural resources, preventing the identity and erasing Palestinian culture and civil rights. Crucial elements of the report talks as the, its game changer is the fact that it's first in over three decades to mention Palestine, Palestinian right to resist the occupation. Special Rapporteur argues the international community to formally acknowledge the condemned settler colonial nature of Israel occupation 
demand immediate end of the illegal occupation and call to Israel with the, with the military presence. In her mean, powerful words, I'm quoting, meaningful discussion on the political solution for Palestine can only begin when the illegal occupation is dismantled once for all. At the report is very least, special rapporteur courage should serve all wake up calls, especially for the global South scholars and reminds all of us as this anti-colonial movement is still facing challenging and alarming challenging. So as a global um, South scholar, whenever adopted settler colonial framework and engage with rep this report or similar reports in our future research, we probably will follow up with a critique similar to the end one following this report. And we can expect it as that it, and we will should be prepared to have clashes uh, back given the fact that it brings settler colonial discourse to re-expect the reflect of how anti-colonial movements still faces intimidated challenges. As a scholar, we are aware for international law limitation and historical fa fa failure while dealing with the Palestinian struggle, the report can provide to us space for more expansive discourse, such as this report proposing, and willing to challenge the power dynamic at play with ba uh, put back in the center Palestinians, Palestinian lived, lived experience, lived experience and agency with shedding the light on those more involved in the struggle on the ground. Identifying the Zionism settler colonialism and Zionism ideology on the root of Israel apartheid system and the ethos of the Israeli system and the state, this report suggested settler colonial framework in order to decolonize the in contracts with merely advocating for liberal, liberal equality and hopeless negotiation towards peace. As an academic, we need to remember that international law recognized the applicability of multiple framework in Palestine, where apartheid does not displace the reality of Israeli occupation, nor wider contexts of settler colonization. Use the settler colonial decolonization addresses the roots of the struggle, broaden the Palestinian political, political imagination and the terms of the struggle on the ground. As such, shifting the focus from Israeli occupation since 67 and to apartheid framework over Palestinian as whole include recognition of the colonization of historical Palestine as an ongoing process. Hence, to recognize the apartheid within the context of settler colonization is not only accurate description of the situation on the ground, but also examining the roots caused of denial of Palestinian rights for over a century. And this is how report can have an impact in the, also the academic and civil society work. This is the voice who must be centered and emphasized, the voice of Palestinian organization on the ground, Palestinian who do we need to, they don't need any reforms to how we should live our lives, our, our life living conditions under the regime of its Zionism. But it's dismantlement, dismantlement of its very foundation. We do want liberal equity, liberal, liberal equality. We want decolonization, liberation, justice, and dignity. And this is what this report can contribute to our useful tool for unpacking any future challenges and more questions to be brought up while examining the Palestinian struggle in our future academic work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hadil, for shedding light on the multiple frameworks that we could apply uh, to the Palestinian people. Um, in these important discussions and also uh, emphasizing the importance of the shared experiences of the Palestinian people. Um, I will now move to our next speaker, uh, Josh Rubner. Josh is an adjunct, uh, adjunct uh, lecture, lecturer in the Justice and Peace Studies at the Georgetown University. He is currently pursuing his PhD at the University of Exeter Exeter's European Center for Palestinian Studies. Josh, um, we're interested uh, uh, in your insight on the report, especially in regards to creating this paradigm shift um, and understanding how this will actually make a difference um, on the level of third states, whether it's uh, in Europe, but also in particular in the US. Thank you so much, Deanna, for that kind introduction. And thank you to Law for Palestine for hosting this important webinar. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be among such esteemed colleagues and especially to get the opportunity to respond to Francesca Albanese's very, very important 
report that she's just issued. So when we look at the question you posed, Deanna, and I'll confine my remarks to the US context, can Francesca's report lead to the type of paradigm shift that she is seeking to uh, develop through her report in the United States? Well, first, we really need to understand what has been the dominant paradigm for thinking about this issue in the United States in the last 30 years. So from the end of the Clinton administration through the George W. Bush administration and all the way through the Obama administration, the United States held that a negotiated two-state resolution was the only feasible and possible resolution to the Israel-Palestine issue. The U.S. dominant paradigm also held that only the United States could be and would be responsible for leading this negotiated process. And all three of these presidents did use significant political capital in order to try to accomplish this resolution. But of course, as we all understand, we need to uh, put an important caveat on this dominant paradigm, which is that the United States never intended to lead a process that would eventuate and, and lead to the establishment of a truly sovereign Palestinian state. From Clinton to Bush to Obama, the idea always was for a non-sovereign entity in parts of occupied Palestinian territory to be controlled and dominated by Israel. So this was the dominant narrative and the dominant paradigm for much of the so-called Oslo years. Now, we also have to understand that there have been dramatic shifts in the, the dominant paradigm in the United States over the past two administrations. Under the Trump administration, the notion that there had to be a negotiated resolution went out the window. And instead, Trump allowed Israel to try to impose unilaterally its own vision and its own resolution on the Palestinian people, where, of course, Trump authorized Israel to annex at its will 40% of the West Bank outside of the context of negotiations. But it's important to realize, and I really want to stress this, that while Trump may have differed in his procedure, the end result was still the same. The end result was still a non-sovereign entity that was envisioned by the United States under Israel's domination. This brings us to the current day and the Biden administration, where the Biden administration has adopted this strange formulation that Israelis and Palestinians deserve equal measures of freedom, security, and dignity. Whatever that means, the Biden administration has never defined what that actually means in terms of concrete policy. And the Biden administration has also done something very important. They said that we are not going to expend any political capital in actually trying to help negotiate a two-state resolution, but we are only going to preserve the conditions on the ground that will eventually, in the undetermined future, make it possible for a resumption of negotiating negotiations to take place. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has done absolutely nothing to actually press Israel on any of its policies that may, in theory, preserve those conditions for the outcome that he supposedly seeks. So, what does Francesca's report and what does this background mean for the likelihood that the United States can and should engage in a similar paradigm shift, uh, both in the short term and in the long term? Well, the results of the Israeli election held last week will certainly help the United States to move us along in this paradigm shift. 
but it certainly won't be enough. And I want to stress, I don't want to be overly optimistic. I want to stress that there is no chance, no chance of moving the Biden administration into a paradigm shift as is envisioned by this report that Francesca has released. But I do think that it will help shift the public discourse in the United States. And I do think that it will help shift the discourse in Congress, especially amongst the more progressive members of Congress who are at the forefront of advocating for Palestinian rights in the United States. Now, there's three quick points I want to make about why I think the language and the framing uh, of, of the paradigm shift that Francesca outlines uh, in her report is really critical to engage with for a U.S. audience in particular. The first point I want to make is her stress correctly on the illegality of Israel's military occupation per se. So what this does in a U.S. context is that it takes the idea that Palestinians should somehow have to negotiate their way out of military occupation, and it places the demand firmly into one where the United States is called upon as a third party to stop aiding and abetting what is an illegal situation. And we don't particularly care for international law here in the United States, as you all know. But even if we are to continue to disregard international law in our politics, we still have our own domestic laws in the United States that would allow us to cut off all forms of funding and weapons to Israel in order to ensure that we are no longer aiding and abetting Israel's crimes in the occupied Palestinian territories. Point number two I want to make. By grounding the Israeli-Palestinian issue in settler colonialism, it allows us here in the United States to help us reframe the issue uh, as a continuation of Israeli policy since 1948. It allows us to talk about the ongoing Nakba as a continuation of policy, with 1967 not being so much of a dramatic transformation in Israeli policy, but as another stage in this settler colonialism. And then finally, the third point I want to make is the importance of highlighting self-determination, because the issue of Palestinian self-determination has been completely off of the U.S. policy and political discourse agenda from time immemorial. And by reframing this, not as two sides, not as some type of moral equivalency where both parties need to sit around the negotiating table and talk through their issues as if there are two sovereign parties, which of course we know there aren't, what Francesca's report help does is to reframe this for U.S. audiences as a contest between oppressed versus oppressors. And this will create the, the sharpening of the moral dimensions of the issue that we need in the United States to get us off of this dominant paradigm that we've been under for now 30 years. So let me conclude by saying that while I don't want to be overly optimistic and tell you that this report is going to influence the Biden administration in any dramatic way, because it's not, I do want to stress that because of the demographic changes that are underway in the United States and because of the attitudinal transformations that are underway in the United States, I do really believe that we have very good long-term prospects for adopting the type of paradigm shift that Francesca outlines in her report here in the United States. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's a very important tool uh, to push the message of the Palestinian people forward, uh, especially in, in Congress and amongst the younger generations in the US. 
Um, I will now turn to our last speaker for today, Itai Epstein. Itai is the Special Advisor in International Law and Humanitarian Principles to the Norwegian Refugee Council, NRC. He's also the legal advisor to the Association of International Development Agencies, IDA. Itai was also the legal advisor with the Iaconia's IHL Center and the country director of Amnesty International Israel. Itai, uh, please, I would like you to elaborate on the role of the global civil society in promoting this new understanding and analysis amongst the international community and their approaches towards the context in Palestine and Israel. Um, thank you, Deanna. Friends, colleagues, we are often told that the international community considers uh, it of utmost importance to restore a political horizon towards a two-state solution, securing a just and lasting peace. Uh, regrettably, and, and despite that recognition, the occupation has become uh, further entrenched with Israel's systematic forcible alteration um, of the legal status, uh, character, demographic composition of Palestinian uh, territory. Uh, in the backdrop of Dr. Albanese, Francesca's report is the protracted character um, of Israeli occupation, numerous well-documented um, breaches of international law and the humanitarian plight uh, that it necessarily um, creates. Much of my work focuses on that. It has led scholars, uh, a succession of UN special rapporteurs. Uh, I'm very encouraged to see um, a former special rapporteur, Professor Richard Falk, um, through Professor Michael Link and to Francesca, um, and indeed, uh, the Commission of Inquiry to accurately characterize it as premeditated um, to permanently settle Jewish Israeli population in occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, and as such, we should refer to it as an act of, act of aggression, um, as any annexation uh, by the use of force of the territory of another state or parts thereof uh, would, be, would be considered under international uh, law. In fact, uh, this is the um, current political ponton. Um, my careful prediction is that Israel and its emboldened incoming government uh, will become even more heavy handed in repressing, uh, suppressing Palestinians, um, introducing changes that we've already seen uh, to the rules of engagement methods and means used in administering, uh, prolonging its, its occupation. Just to give you one example, the use of, of lethal drones until very recently, the preserve of Gaza has now been deployed. These lethal drones have now been deployed uh, to the West Bank used in extrajudicial uh, execution. We've seen settler harassment uh, and violence targeting Palestinian uh, persons and property. Uh, they're prevalent in those areas where Israel established outposts, uh, satellites, uh, settlement neighborhoods owing to the particular uh, demographics uh, of those and the complicity of Israeli armed um, forces. We've seen spatial plans for settlement uh, establishment and expansion, including um, uh, those advanced by the outgoing uh, government. They're centered in those areas most disruptive to a territorially contiguous and economically viable future Palestinian state. It's indicative of a continued attempt to acquire uh, the territory and in perpetuity. Uh, the inco incoming government would do more of the same, more of the same. Um, corollary to settlement uh, establishment and expansion, we've, we've witnessed a surge in the destruction of Palestinian uh, property uh, throughout 2021 and 2022, including structures provided as humanitarian uh, relief funded by the U and its member states implemented by NRC and many of the IDA uh, members. Uh, the Israeli acquisition uh, of parts of the West Bank is matched with the severance of Gaza uh, from it, which would otherwise constitute a single self-determination unit, a single uh, unit. So rather than advancing uh, towards a politically independent, territorially contiguous, permanently sovereign Palestinian state, Israeli policies retrograde over time towards permanent alien rule over the Palestinian people, denying them the realization of self-determination. And given that the denial of Palestinian right to self-determination is intentional uh, by Israel, inherent uh, to its prolonged 
occupation of Palestinian territory and the disenfranchisement of the Palestinian people, we arrive again at the nadir uh, of confidence in the pacific and just resolution of the Palestine uh, question. So what are we to do as, as principled uh, global civil society? We have no answer other than the unwavering enforcement of the law of self-determination as the cornerstone uh, of any political sol solution, not an afterthought. Um, the report uh, presented by the Special Rapporteur uh, contains uh, such appealing observations and recommendations that we would be remiss uh, if we did not engage them collectively and with a sense uh, of urgency. In, in the time remaining, allow me to focus on three elements in the report. First, the violations described in the report expose the nature uh, of the Israeli occupation. And I quote that of an intentionally acquisitive, segregationist, and repressive regime. So the first priority uh, for global civil society is the protection of Palestinians whose vulnerability in humanitarian needs increase by the year, by the month. Um, current activities aimed at ensuring the safety, protection, well being of the Palestinian. Uh, population, including the provision of humanitarian relief, monitoring and reporting uh, of international law breaches, humanit and humanitarian diplomacy that comes with it, legal protection uh, through information dissemination, counseling, litigation, international public interest uh, advocacy, they must all uh, continue. Uh, they are absolutely necessary, in my view. Uh, we should consider establishing a more visible humanitarian uh, presence, not because we are tempted to think that this is going to be resolved by the provision of humanitarian relief or humanitarian uh, protection. It is because additional human rights monitoring and, and protection, uh, if deployed, could prov provide us with a, with a better situational analysis, strengthen preventive um, capacities, uh, and demonstrate the international community's focus on and commitment to protecting Palestinian civilians under um, an increasingly uh, brutal Israeli occupation. Uh, in, in respect to that, addressing the shrinking space of civil society organizations and human rights defenders is a priority. And the continued provision of humanitarian and legal assistance uh, in collaboration with Palestinian and Israeli civil society is a vital, vital component of humanitarian action. Second, the Special Rapporteur's report refocuses us on an inalienable truth as a peremptory norm of international law, the right to self-determination cannot be derogated from under any uh, circumstances, and it gives rise to obligations or ominous obligations owed to the international community uh, as a whole. Our humanitarian diplomacy uh, targeting third parties, third states, third um, international organizations should move along the axis of state responsibility for internationally wrongful uh, behavior beginning with Israel's obligation uh, to comply and that of third states to not recognize, aid, or assist its wrongful behavior, shall it persist. We are also positioned um, to bring attention to the obligation of third parties to cooperate in bringing uh, breaches and serious violations uh, to an end by all lawful, and they are plentiful means available to states and to the United Nations. And by holding third states accountable, should they be derelict in this, their duty. Uh, it follows uh, from the fact that the duty to cooperate concerns the international community writ large, that we develop a network of secondary obligations. We've established a network of secondary obligations. What this means is that the beneficiary of the duty um, impose on third states to react to a violation is not only the victim of the first violations, Palestinian tormented by Israel, but also the international community uh, as a whole. Um, in the case of a violation of a peremptory norm, such as the right uh, to self-determination, the legal character of the secondary obligation to cooperate is the same as that of the primary obligation, meaning that the secondary obligation to cooperate in bringing Israeli wrongful behavior, its prolongation of occupation uh, to an end, possesses a peremptory uh, character and therefore prevails over uh, political preferences, prevails over political 
uh, convenience or indeed over other state interests, uh, which all too often carry the day. Third and, and finally, uh, the report argues that the Middle East peace process and subsequent bilateral um, peacemaking uh, attempts have proven ineffective for the reason that they have not focused uh, their approaches on human rights, particularly the right to self-determination of peoples, of the Palestinian people. They've overlooked the settler colonial underpinnings uh, of Israeli occupation. What we should do is openly confront the attempted permanency of Israeli occupation, including the actions undertaken by it to acquire Palestinian territory in perpetuity and settle it with its, uh, with its own nationals to the absolute detriment uh, of Palestinians. Um, one advice that we have seen uh, special rapporteurs make, and, and more recently, the Human Rights Council Commission of Cry, is to address this question to the International Court of, of Justice, the ICJ. Uh, I think given changes in both um, factual circumstances and the development of, of international law in the areas of, of use cogens and state responsibility since its last um, advisory opinion in, in 2004, uh, perhaps it's time to, for the court to revisit uh, that opinion and correct some of the errors, the legal errors uh, made uh, then. Uh, if it is requested to advise on the legal consequences of the continued refusal by Israel to end um, its occupation and on the obligations of third states and the United Nations to ensure that Israel respects international law. Uh, all of this not subject uh, to negotiations. Those of you familiar uh, with the 2004 advisory opinion, I suspect this is most on, on this call, would know uh, that while there is a recognition of Palestinian self-determination, that is subjected uh, to the successful outcome of bilateral negotiations. I think what the report uh, does is it um, clearly states that the right to self-determination is inalienable, non-derogable as a peremptory norm. It cannot be subjected uh, to the outcome of, of negotiations or, or indeed to the resumption of negotiations. So as, as global civil society, we should put our resources behind an ICJ advisory opinion. We can and should commit resources uh, to preparatory work and the necessary uh, mobilization that would have the UN General Assembly ask uh, the ICJ for an advisory opinion on the refusal on the part of Israel to respect the right of Palestinian people to self-determination. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Atai, for uh, highlighting the legal obligations uh, on the international community in light of the continuous illegality of the situation on the ground. I would like now to give the floor to Francesca again for three minutes uh, to um, respond to some of the comments made by our speakers today, and then we will move to questions and comments uh, of the audience. Uh, let me use my three minutes well. So very, very few things. But first of all, thank you very much. I was um, I was really elated uh, to hear your comments. But one one thing that we some said, why did it take so long to say that? I don't think it took it took long in the sense that if if you look at what the General Assembly in particular has done between the the, the late sixties and the um, late eighties, the question of Palestine has been dealt with as a question of decolonization. It's in the past. 30 years somewhat from Oslo that the paradigm has changed for the reasons that were discussed. But I also took courage to, uh, to, to simplify the, the, the interpretation of, um, of the right of self-determination from my predecessors, because all of them, I mean, from Richard Falk to, um, to uh, Michael Link, had pointed to the colonial practices. But it was important to spell it out better, because one of the counter arguments was to dismiss this, this uh, um, qualification as ideological. So here we have the evidence, and the evidence is based on the right of self-determination. And I'm, another element I wanted to add is um, I uh, the building on what uh, Hadil and um, and Josh, Josh said, I think that what the report might, might help with, and I like what Josh said, the sharpening of the moral dimension, is uh, by using an expression that I heard um, by um, 
scholar and friend Nicola Perugini is conscientization. This report clears the, the air somewhat and, and calls a spade a spade. And, um, and it doesn't leave room for hypocrisy, although still there will be a lot uh, on the way ahead. But I know, for example, from my recent experience with the General Assembly, that the states who are most sensitive to this argument that, Palest that Palestine, the question of Palestine needs to be seen as a, a decolonization one that is uh, not completed, are the states who have gone through colonialism themselves. They are the sensitive ones to this argument. And, and so it's very important that in the General Assembly, this discourse gets uh, reignited and for civil society to stay united. Because I see also a lot of fragmentation in the civil society calling for different things, but eventually decolonization is bringing down the illegal occupation, the apartheid regime and every other violation that it entails. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I would actually like to highlight that Law for Palestine will be publishing in the coming two days a detailed commentary on this report discussing its various legal and socio-legal aspects. Um, before I actually move into Q&A by the audience, and I would like to remind you that you can raise your hand so that this uh, discussion is a bit more engaging. And because it's also much easier for me to, to give you the floor to ask your question rather than read your questions in the chat. But I will quickly um, summarize some of the questions that came into chat. Um, so there's what, there was a question about um, ethnic cleansing. Why isn't the report or, or other academic uh, work in this context is recognizing ethnic cleansing and dealing with that in this context. Another question was, um, how could students in international relations or, or law help? Um, and how can they study international law away from hollow decisions and political decisions that lead to major frustrations um, in, in this context. The third question would be, um, what action would the UN plan to take when uh, the UN Special Rapporteur is actually denied entry into, into the country? And uh, if this is the case, Francesca, please elaborate. Um, uh, I know you have communicated to the embassy and uh, heard no responses. But, uh, were you actually denied entrance? Um, Possibly these three questions can be addressed by you, Francesca. Uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, uh, why I do not talk about ethnic cleansing? I do refer to ethnic cleansing, for example, in connection with what has happened to Palestine in uh, in uh, as of 1947-48 uh, uh, in my previous work. In the context, I mean, the legal categories are others. And in fact, I try to use as much as possible the words of the legal framework available. So forcible transfer and other other um, other uh, cases, other, uh, uh, sorry, I'm missing the word in English, it comes in Latin, but however, other, yeah, other, other legal cases are referred to um, in the report by their by their legal name because I think it makes more sense also when it, when then we call upon states to abide by given obligations and hold Israel responsible for violations. Um, I'm not quite sure I understood the question regarding frustration, so we might go back to that later. But regarding the, the denial of entry, I've tried to engage with the with Israeli authorities in Geneva asking for meetings and the meeting, the meeting request was denied. Technically, I've not yet been denied entry because um, I've not tried to go as of yet. I tried to discuss and maintain a dialogue. The dialogue has led nowhere. So now I plan to go and then I will inform the Israeli authorities accordingly. Where I see a problem is with the entire machinery around me expecting that I take no action because in any case, Israel is not going to give you a visa. 
if the occupation is illegal, it's not even normal that we expect, I mean, in a way we normalize this illegality by expecting that the system issues us visa, especially because I'm not, I'm not a UN officer in duty in, uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory. I am I be an expert on mission. And so uh, with an invitation of the Palestinian Authority, I think that the only thing that Israelis should do is to not to hamper my entry. I wouldn't ask for more. And of course, if they want to meet me, I'm very happy to. But so again, it's the fact that I don't take it for granted that I've been denied a visa. When it happens, let's get all um, up to action to, to address this issue. Wissam, maybe you can address the question uh, of the students and studying law in this context and the frustration. Uh, but I would also like to add to that, um, how is it possible to address abstract nature, nature of international law when it comes to the question of Palestine? Often uh, monitoring and reporting is not enough. Uh, the annexation of land and confiscation has not only continued, but it, it has reached unprecedented ends. And this essentially has killed the, the two-state solution. Well, and they apologize, sorry with some, because the, the line broke as Diana was talking, so I couldn't understand the question, but please go ahead. It's okay. Um, I think uh, both questions are uh, interconnected in the sense that uh, um, uh, when we engage with law students, uh, um, and I, I think it's important to look at uh, those that we engage with here within the Palestinian context and, and try to instill within them uh, this appreciation for international law as a tool uh, for the pursuit of the right self-determination um, in the broader decolonization uh, process. And, and uh, the questions that uh, come to their mind is, uh, why hasn't it worked? And I think uh, this is uh, the the question uh, that uh, those students at the international level outside of Palestine need to work towards addressing because uh, it is uh, this issue of studying international law in the abstract sense. Um, when you read about the, the law being applied uh, universally and you see it uh, exceptionalized within the Palestinian context, uh, this uh, undermines the, the integrity of the system as a whole. And I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's incumbent upon uh, those students of international law that see it as a, as a tool for the pursuit of a particular objective, uh, uh, which is the realization of those rights, rather than simply a subject of study, uh, to put it to the test across uh, all contexts. And when they run into the challenges of the Palestinian context, where it becomes this issue of progressive except for Palestine, they need to push against it. And this is where the framing of the colonial uh, lens helps uh, to, to empower uh, those students that want to challenge this uh, in a broader sense, I think, uh, um, and, and give the law meaning, uh, because if it's constantly exceptionalized, uh, specifically within the Palestinian context, I think it, uh, it adds to the frustration because it makes it the law uh, really useless uh, when uh, those uh, political interests, as if I mentioned, uh, come into uh, the fray, uh, then uh, then it undermines that uh, the value of that system. And in order for it to really function, it has to trump uh, those interests. Um, otherwise, uh, we risk uh, slipping slipping down a, a slippery slope where uh, the law is only used as a tool of uh, uh, imperial ambitions rather sure. than the realization of rights. Thank you. As, sorry, uh, Diana, as Richard Polk, who is here, would say, we propose a counter hegemonic use of international law. Actually, Professor Richard Falk, uh, the former UN Special Rapporteur, also in the situation of the OPT, would be uh, my next speaker and guest of honor to, to discuss mm -hmm. or, or share his comments and thoughts. Please go ahead, Professor. You're muted. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Fr Francesca, again for uh, this great and historically important report. And uh, I learned a great deal from the commentators uh, this morning. 
I want um, I want to say a couple of things uh, that might be clarifying. The first is on the nature of settler colonialism. I think it's very important to understand that it's a incomplete process as well as a uh, orientation. In other words, if you look at how uh, Patrick Wolf and others have understood uh, settler colonialism, it's the replacement or total marginalization of the indigenous population. That has not happened to the Palestinian people. They're still there. They're still resisting. They they are a they're resisting the completion of the settler colonial uh, undertaking, and I think it's very important to keep that idea alive. They're not like Australia or the U.S. or Canada that are settler colonial states that have uh, succeeded in replacing the indigenous population. On access, Francesca, you have to prepare, be prepared if you go without a positive signal and possibly even if you get a positive signal uh, with my experience, which was uh, to get positive signals, yet when I arrived at the Ben-Gurion airport, I was denied access and put in a detention center, essentially a prison, uh, uh, overnight and then expelled. Uh, it, it has a, the advantage of certain kind of media salience, but it's an unpleasant experience, I can assure you. And so you should be prepared. I don't, I don't know. Uh, and Israel lied. In my case, they said, we warned you not to come, whereas they actually did just the opposite. They gave visas to my two assistants and they approved my agenda in Geneva. And still they did this. Wow. Uh, they were a, a little embarrassed, but that didn't uh, change the, the mm -hmm. behavior at all. There's a lot to say on international law, uh, that, uh, but it's not entirely accurate to say it is exceptionalized uh, only in relation to Palestine. Uh, uh, the U.S. particularly uh, uh, uses international law as a tool to attack its adversaries but it is felt free to uh, violate international law whenever its strategic interests uh, so incline it to do so. And uh, it's, it's really important to understand that the UN Charter gives the five permanent members a right of exception. They don't have to. They can veto any uh, any decision that tries to implement international law. So the UN was designed to be weak in relation to these geopolitical actors. That's unpleasant, but it seems to me to be part of the uh, the reality that we confront. Where international law is uh, extremely important is in the symbolic domain of politics, which is very influential with civil society activists, because mm -hmm. they trust, uh, they they feel that their activism is legitimated by an international law assessment, and mm -hmm. that uh, uh, that's why uh, Francesca's report is so important in highlighting the crux of the issue as this uh, in, uh, peremptory norm of self-determination. That gives a real focus to civil society activism, and I hope is an awakening call 
to the global south. Uh, she's done a, a great service already, and uh, we should all be grateful to her. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input, uh, Professor Falk, and, and sharing also uh, some of your own shared experiences um, trying to enter into the country. I will uh, give the floor now to um, Taima and then Sultan and then Dr. Samia. Please, each of you, um, I would really appreciate if you keep your intervention or question in less than 30 seconds each. Thank you so much, everyone, for this. Um, I'm a student at Brazil University, and I'm doing international relations and computer science. I'm still in my BA, so I would uh, I came across the report and I was pleasantly surprised of the strong jet terminology. And I didn't I honestly didn't think that was possible uh, in a UN, uh, um, you know. Uh, chamber. Uh, so very quickly, what is one tip you would give international relations students or law students to get more stronger activism on Palestine, especially that we get uh, we need to run so many through so many hoops uh, in terminology and all the cancel culture and the noise that has to do with international relations and it's really it's it's power relations really uh, when going into those chambers and expressing ourselves. Um, and one more thing is that. What is, of course, we would love to have you uh, as Berzet University students to talk deeply about the report if you have time. Um, but what do you think is the next step after those reports? Mm -hmm. How can we not get dust on them and actually get them moving? Uh, thank you so much. Sultan? شكرا لكم على هذه العروض القيمة سؤالي بداية لأنه تحدث الحبيب النعيمي الدكتور الحبيب النعيمي من زميل باحث في لوفر فلسطين متخصص في قضايا العدالة الجنائية الدولية سؤالي إلى السادة المحاضرين بخصوص تقرير فرانسيسكا وموجه أساسا إلى القيادة الفلسطينية لكي تراجع الموقف من الصراع الفلسطيني الإسرائيلي Sultan, Sultan, I'm sorry for interrupting just want to uh, tell our uh... Uh, English uh, listeners that uh, if they want to listen to the intervention in English, they can uh, change by clicking on the global icon in the uh, Zoom window. Okay, thank you. And uh, sorry, Diana, for... Uh, Go ahead, Sultan. Tadal, Sultan. كما قلت بأن تقرير المقرير فرانسيسكا البانيز هو دعوة إلى القيادة الفلسطينية بخصوص مراجعة سياسة تقييمها للسلع الفلسطيني الإسرائيلي أعتقد بأنه دعوة إلى الرجوع إلى المربع الأول أي شروط الرجوع إلى شروط التفاوض وليس إلى مواضيع التفاوض وبالتالي هذا المدخل مهم لتقييم الوضع الحالي أعتقد بأن تقرير فرانسيسكا هو يحمل كثير من السياسة ولكن بلغة القانون الدولي سؤالي هنا باختصار إلى السادة المتدخلين ما هي الأفاق أو التوجهات التي يمكن أن تبادر إليها القيادة الفلسطينية بعد هذا التقرير الذي يشكل سابقا بالناحية القانونية والسياسية دكتور سامية مساء الخير دكتورة سامية أستاذة قانون دولي عام من غزة أنا عايزة في البداية أشكركم جدا على عقد هذه الندوة عايزة أشكر المقررة على تقريرها الجريء والهام جدا وبصراحة وأنا بقرأ فيه حسيت أنه لكاتبه يعني حد فلسطيني جدا ومناصر للقضية الفلسطينية وشخص الوضع بشكل صحيح وخاصة لما تطرقت لمسألة الاحتلال طويل الأمد وهي من أهم التحديات اللي بتواجهنا في القانون الدولي لأنه بيخلق واقع على الأرض مستقبلا بيكون صعب جدا معالجتها أو أو تصدي إلها ماذا بعد إصدار هذا التقرير شهدنا في السابق الكثير من التقارير الدولية الهامة ولكن للأسف لم يتم استغلالها أو استثمارها أو البناء عليها هذا تقرير هام بعد وقع أنه يجب العمل على استكمال خطواته في ضرورة إصدار قرارات مكملة 
ممكن تعتبر كآليات تنفيذية فيما يتعلق قرار بضرورة إنهاء حصار غزة الظالم المستمر من 18 من 16 عام ضرورة إصدار قرار بتجريم وإنهاء الاحتلال الإسرائيلي وعزل وحصار في المنظومة الدولية بشكل عام ضرورة استكمال وبرضه هذا كان موجود في التقرير المقرر إصدار قائمة بسماء الشركات العاملة في المستوطنات الإسرائيلية وتحديثها بشكل دوري لتفعيل المقاطعة حتى نكون يعني مش مجرد كلام وهو كلام مهم جدا ولكن يجب ان ان ينفذ ويترجم الى خطوات عمليه نقطه مهمه جدا انا عايزه اضيفها انه التقرير هذا وعلى الرغم انه هو بيناقش الاوضاع في الاراضي الفلسطينيه المحتله ولكن السياسه الاسرائيليه المتبعه فيه في التعامل مع الشعب الفلسطيني ومصادره حقه في تقرير المصير وكونه نظام عنصري و نظام استيطاني استعماري احلالي بقدر لا لا استطيع ابدا تجاهل ان هذه هي سياسه متبعه حتى في داخل دوله اسرائيل مع الفلسطينيين المقيمين داخل الدوله واكبر دليل هو اعتبار اعلان يهوديه الدوله يعني نفس الوضع اللي بيتعرض الفلسطيني في الضفه في غزه هو بيتعرض الفلسطيني المقيم في داخل دوله اسرائيل هي سياسه واحده اذا ينبغي مواجهتها فينبغي مواجهتها في كل في, في كل مكان مش هنقدر ولا نستطيع ان احنا نضع حد لممارسات اسرائيل في الضفه وغزه وبمعزل عن عما يحدث لاهلنا في داخل اراضي 48 وزي ما قلت هي سياسه واحده قائمه على الفصل العنصري ونظام استيطاني استعماري احلالي بيحاول القضاء على الهويه والوجود الفلسطيني اينما كان شكرا لاصدار هذا التقرير بتمنى انه يتبعه فيما يلي خطوات هامه لترجمته على ارض الواقع ودائما مشكله القانون الدولي انه بدون انياب واحنا محتاجين انياب حتى توفر حمايه لشعبنا ولتمتعنا بحق تقرير المصير شكرا لكم Thank you, Samia. Um, just to engage also with our uh, other speakers, uh, Hadil, uh, maybe you can address the question from the Birzeit uh, student. Um, Itai, also, I would like to hear your thoughts on some of the questions here. And uh, finally, um, uh, going back to Francesca. Yeah, to the thanks, Lena. The question of the student: We have to address the colonization again. The settler and uh, colonial uh, arguments should be taking over. We have our voice as our Palestinian narratives and apologetically, and like establish this through more critical approaches for international law. We shouldn't take uh, international law as accepted without any critiquing, such as uh, adopting. Uh, uh, there is like a third world approaches for international law that they are trying to produce an alternative work of what international law should be, what's the impact, what's the implication, how that could stop and not maintain instead of maintaining the colonization that was in the past and what accepted and anti-colonial colonial system should be de facto working in this, using this discourse as one of the framework to try to implement what global South scholars could have uh, in, in, the, in the ground to change the situation and using the objective uh, Academic tools is one tool. Frustration always will be whenever we are under oppression, but still we could have our own narrative using the platforms and the arguments that such report provided us that we, uh, before we have more limited access to resources. So we need to keep taking that into account and still the challenges of all colonization and anti-colonization, we still keep our voices loud in the same time of where everything, we're, we're against anti-colonization whenever it comes to Palestine. In the, where just like the international law was uh, silent. And hopefully this report will provide it kind of new, um, you know, discussion going forward, how we could change that using, again, third world approaches and the global south and apologetically for we came from, from bias or non-bias, but still using the academic tool and the objectivity by providing uh, tools and um, the double faith as we can see in the international world going on kind of frustration but still we have this to we have to use this tool as one of a way of, of you know encountering this um occupation and colonization thank you it's high. thank you perhaps ending with with an anecdote um i think many of you would be aware of the work of the international law commission on peremptory norms of international law, they include the basic principles of international humanitarian law, the prohibition um, on aggression and acquisition of territory, annexation, uh, the prohibition on racial segregation, domination, and apartheid, and indeed, 
uh, the right to self-determination. Uh, what they all or many have in common is that they've been outright violated uh, by Israel through its protracted occupation of Palestinian territory. Interestingly, um, these this draft developed by the International Law Commission was brought before the one of the main committees of the General Assembly just a few months ago, the Sixth Com Committee. Israel had one reservation as to that list of peremptory norms. And uh, in its reservations was arguing that the right of peoples to self-determination is has not risen to the level. There is no evidence that it has risen to the level of a peremptory norm of international law from which um, you know, no derogation is, is permitted. I think that tells the whole story. Israel um, and others, its allies in Europe, um, in the US, um, are on the offensive uh, when it comes to not the law as it is, but the implementation of, of international law. And I think where, where the gaps are is not in inventing new law, is, is in taking account, as you know, Francesca's report did, taking account of the law as it is and how it has developed progressively over many decades and pointing at the gap of implementation. I think what we as jurists uh, can do is eliminate or narrow down the room for political preference. There is always going to be a margin of political appreciation in the way other states um, act. There is always going to be a uh, margin of appreciation the way the pa Palestinian leadership, established established leadership, um, act. But I think we need to, you know, to, to the extent possible, guide that margin of appreciation of political preference. Um, along the lines of international law. I think, uh, Francesca, you put it aptly uh, in your uh, report and the comments you've made, I think, when you presented this in, in the third committee um, the week before before last. It's international law that should orient politics. That should be the guiding force of international politics, not the other way around as we have it now. Thank you. Francesca? Yeah, there was also, thank you very much also for the other comments um, from the speakers. I, there was a comment from, a question from Mishana who was asking if I um, interact or I coordinate with the Commission of Inquiry. Yes, I do. In fact, one of the things that I feel very compelled to and responsible for is making sure that uh, the issue uh, the issues I take in, I take care of as a mandate holder are sort of mainstreamed because again there are so many thematic rapporteurs so many other mechanisms that, that would be interested in in what I do so I do try to coordinate and particularly of course with the commission of inquiry you might have noticed the last recommendation of my report is to the commission of inquiry in order for them to look at self-determination uh, for the entire Palestinian people. And not because I cannot answer what the right of self-determination is for the Palestinian citizens of Israel, but because the violations of their right to that portions of the Palestinian population require a proper, um, a proper mandate that I do not have. Um, to the question raised by uh, by uh, Taima and what is what what can what comes next? Well, first of all, I want to say that human rights are like a promise. They are not. I mean, I wish they were they were connected to an immediately realized reality, but they are not. So our work as jurists, as human rights lawyers or advocates, or activists, whatever we do in life or scholars, our work is to make sure, as Itai said, that the space between the principle and the reality is, uh, is as narrow as possible and rights become, become a living reality for all. I think that what I expect from, my, from this report and I will pursue this by engaging with a number, number of stakeholders, is to a shift of mindset, first and foremost. Again, it's, the, the, it's clear that what is being done so far is not, is not only wrong, but also 
failing everyone, including not just the Palestinian, but including the Israeli society. And I often say bringing down a settler colonial endeavor is an act of courage, but it's also an act of love because it takes a lot of um, a lot of uh, of um, of strength to overcome the current reality and to let go our own privilege. I personally know that there are probably not many in, in the current Jewish-Israeli society, but there are those who are incredibly unhappy with the system as is. And they are part of that struggle to bring down the settler colonial, the settler colonial endeavor that Israel has put in place. Now, um, I, I think that every actor uh, has different responsibilities. For example, the UN. I hear Itai says we should have a different humanitarian or more humanitarian presence. I do. I do not know if it's more the word what is needed, but surely it's 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 a different engagement of humanitarian actors because the Palestinian question has become a humanitarian file to hand in perpetuity instead of a political question to resolve in line with international law, which means that the, all, the, the very humanitarians on the ground should um, stop addressing the occupation of it, uh, as if it was a normal fact of life. It's illegal. It's absolutely unlawful. And so the rules of engagement should, uh, should change. Um, in order not to normalize it further, I want to I want to make a, a, an issue, make a comment which is quite very important for me. I'm, I'm this is not the first time I hear uh, someone saying, oh, oh, "Oh my God, it seems that this report was written by a Palestinian." No, it was written by an objective international lawyer who knows the law and who knows the facts, who knows the history of what, that has befallen the Palestinian people. That is all. And, and again, this is why it's not difficult for me to recognize the plight that both the, 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 the Jewish people at the hand of European anti-Semitism first and foremost, and then the Palestinians have, have undergone. But this also doesn't take me away from recognizing what has gone wrong since the early 900 and, and, and particularly since 1967. So it's just about, uh, if you apply the law, because the law in the case of, the, of Palestine has been closer to uh, to politics, the, to justice. But if you apply the law for what it is, for what it means in terms of human rights, you will have uh, a natural reorganization of the man mindset and the politics around the question of, of Palestine. And I, again, this is what I will strive for in the coming uh, months and years. I will have other 11 reports to write. The the, the framework will always be the same. Again, I think that we need to address the legality of uh, Israeli occupation and the legality of its settler colonial endeavor, which doesn't dismiss, rather the contrary. It en encompasses the need to dismantle apartheid, but also it means uh, uh, advocating for reparations for the wrongdoings. It, it advocates for non-recognition of the current reality and for res responsibilities of every state who's currently an enabler of the of the ongoing illegal occupation. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, due to we are we have already exceeded the time of this um, panel discussion, and I feel like we could still continue for the next hour. Um, but I will give final remarks to, to our um, amazing speakers today, uh, starting uh, by Josh. Well, thank you, Deanna. I'll be brief and just maybe respond to the last three comments and questions. And what I sensed was a, a common theme to the question of what do we do now with Francesca's report? And I think the answer is different for based on where we stand. So I think for, for students, for other civil society actors, I think it's one more very, very important addition uh, to the growing consensus uh, within the international community about the need to engage in campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions to end Israeli oppression. Uh, and I think that the BDS campaign, and to be honest, has, has kind of been lost by the international community in in recent years after a very promising start i think we need to get back to 
those fundamentals of, of engaging it and using this report as a, as a new springboard to that. And I appreciate Dr. Samia's uh, hesitations in, in noting that this is just, you know, one one more report and what, what do we do with it? Uh, and, you know, if you read Professor Lori Allen's book, uh, uh, False Hope, you know, there's been more than 103 years of investigative commissions that have gone to Palestine and have determined that Zionism and the policies of the state of Israel violate the self-determination of the Palestinian people. So we have copious, copious reports from various commissions and they're all excellent. And yet they haven't done anything to change the situation dramatically. So, you know, in that regard, I would I would say a couple of things, I think, in, in response to Sultan's comment about, you know, how how can this be used by Palestinian leadership? I think, you know, the ongoing efforts at the ICC are incredibly important. I think the uh, the report by the Commission of Inquiry uh, making a referral to the ICJ is another very uh, important thing that needs to be considered and, and acted upon and supported by civil society. And you know, look, we don't know which one is going to be the last report that that finally produces the transformation that's needed to end Israeli oppression. All we can do is keep trying. Sam, your final remarks. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. I uh, just want to stress uh, and following Josh's comments that uh, uh, the wheels of justice uh, don't turn by themselves. We have to push. Um, and so uh, we'll take uh, uh, whatever tools uh, are available to continue to push forward. And wherever you are um, in your particular institution, you can uh, play a, a different role. Um, it's up to you to uh, assess uh, where your contribution is going to be uh, uh, the most uh, effective uh, and efficient. Uh, one uh, particular example that addresses the, the economic incentive structure is uh, if you're in Europe, uh, there's a European Citizens Initiative that uh, provides you an opportunity to put your solidarity uh, to uh, 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 with a signature uh, to uh, uh, to address the issue of uh, settlement products uh, that are entering the, the European market as one concrete example of a tangible step that can be taken uh, to uh, um, increase uh, or reduce the benefits uh, associated with Israel's continued colonization of Palestine and change that uh, cost-benefit uh, calculus. Thank you. Hadil, your final remarks? You are muted. Yeah, thanks, Diana, for also moderating this uh, uh, panel. Uh, I can't uh, stress more than with Sam and uh, Josh how we could each could have the uh, responsibility uh, and the obligation to uh, contribute in our way using this report in all the creative possible way in order to encounter injustice occurring in Palestine. <clears throat> and one example where we can not be frustrated is, for instance, Sheikh Jarrah case, how we kept still fighting despite the fact that it's Israeli courts with the creativity and believing and the creativity of the people who brought the topic again on in, in even the young generation who tried to use the social media, a part of regardless the UN uh, illegality of annexation and illegality of, of the situation in the eviction houses of Sheikh Jarrah how everything just came together when, when we kind of all contributed in each our places. The lawyers within the Supreme Israeli court fighting for the, on the, the people, the voices of the people heard and kind of all that had impact. And de facto, we all have way to contribute and we should use all the creativity. And best of luck for, to Francesca for keep writing the rest of the reports and wherever you need any help, we always like uh, here to help. And thanks for everyone. I really enjoyed this panel and the discussion. Thank you, Hadil. Itai, your, your final remarks? Very briefly. Uh, this has been a long struggle. I suspect it will take more time before the question of Palestine, justice in Palestine in all of its dimensions is served. In, in the process, we need to be invigorated, invigorated in our thinking, invigorated in our engagement. This is what the report has done. Uh, and I'm happy to say, I think this is what, you know, this this afternoon, this evening, 
uh, has done with you know the, the many speakers. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that and for all the comments and questions from from colleagues on the call. We need to this continued, not just continued commitment, but continued uh, re re envisaged, um, reinvigorated um, commitment. Um, so thank you, everyone. Final remarks from you, Francesca. One thing that was inspired right now by Itai, I really believe in the butterfly effect. I really believe that by standing really united on the issue and on the front of justice, yeah, there is still a, there is still a long way to go, but we can make it. I'm sure we will see the end of it, of this brutal reality, but the, how how close it is, we don't know and how much suffering this is going to entail it depends on political on the political constellation and how effective we are human rights human rights community um i would like to thank um, myself as well law for palestine and uh, my organization ARDD for, for, for hosting us, Diana, for the wonderful moderation, and to Hadil, Josh, Shitai, and Wissam. What a wonderful, what a wonderful set of discussions. So thank you so much for being uh, with, with us tonight. And thanks to all the friends, old and new, who joined us tonight. Thank you, Francesca. And um, thank you also to Noor and Ammar, our translators. Uh, thank you for your efforts. Uh, I would also like to extend my thank you to Law for Palestine and also ARDD for this um, wonderful uh, panel discussion today and inviting me to, to moderate. Thank you for all the amazing speakers. Thank you for all you uh, who have attended and bared with us um, uh, this um, almost one hour and a half in this important discussion. And um, we all know that exceptionalism and international law um, is there, especially in the context of Palestine. And uh, we as scholars or human rights defenders or, or lawyers, we might progress these analyses even further and in, in our discussions. But it's important that we take these discussions from, from these closed sessions or these events to, to the ground too, and push for, for a serious change. Um, that will actually achieve these rights for the Palestinian people. Um, so engaging with the Palestinian civil society voices and also initiatives such as the initiative mentioned by my colleague Wissam are very, very important to achieve accountability and end Israel settler colonial and apartheid regime prevailing impunity. Thank you all. And uh, I wish you a good day for those of you who are just starting your day and a good evening for the rest of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.